packed with cooking tips, information, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. Right now, it's all about making it easy. Making it easy for yourself in the kitchen means using the time you have effectively. And the one thing that can really help you do that is your freezer. My recipe for meatballs is so versatile, it can be used to make a dozen amazing dishes. One of my favorites is meatballs in fragrant coconut broth. Having a freezer of home-cooked delicious food ready to go can be a real lifesaver. It means you never have to compromise on flavor. These meatballs are delicious, but more importantly, they freeze so well. First off, get your pan on and start sweating off your onions and your garlic. This recipe involves making the meatballs in a classic way, but the exciting part is actually cook them in coconut milk. And it gives a really nice new dimension to a sort of soft, rich, sumptuous meatball. Chop the onion nice and finely, keeping those slices very close together. The closer the slices, the finer the onion. Pat it back down at an angle, slice down, and just chop. I want the onions nice and fine because I want some finesse to these meatballs. And the secret of a really good meatball is the texture, getting that balance right between the minced beef, the breadcrumbs, the milk, and the seasoning. A couple of cloves of garlic. Slice the garlic really nice and thinly. Nice. Pan, nice and hot, and a tablespoon of olive oil. Quite generous with the olive oil. Onions and garlic in. A little touch of salt and pepper. With your mince, open it up a little bit and sort of pat it out. Salt and pepper. For me, a good meatball is all about the, the softness, the texture of that rich beef and the way it sort of melts in your mouth. You can colour it on the outside, but you want it nice and soft and sort of rich in the centre. Mix that in beautifully and then paste it back out again. I've got some really nice dried chilli flakes. I'm going to season the onions with the chilli flakes. Chilli flakes in. Cook that out for two minutes. I'm going to add some milk. Take your breadcrumbs, make a little well, three or four tablespoons of milk. That makes a sort of nice, slightly doughy texture, but it lightens the texture of the meatball. Place that in. Add your onions, your garlic, and your chilli in there as well. Nice. Get your hands in there and start mixing them. If you've got the right amount of milk and breadcrumbs, it doesn't need binding with an egg. Don't make them too small. The problem with making them too small is the fact that they dry out quickly. Just the size of a golf ball. A little bit bigger. Nice. Give them a really nice tight squeeze. That stops it from breaking up. It always pays to double the recipe and spend a bit more time making extra meatballs so you can freeze a batch ready for another time. Give the pan a little wipe out. Don't wash out that pan. We've got that flavour from the onions and the garlic at the bottom. Get that pan nice and hot. A touch of olive oil in there. Place them at the top of your pan. Nice and gently sit them in the oil. Get a palette knife and go underneath them and just sort of tilt the pan and let the pan cook the back of the meatball. We're going to add some heat. Coriander seeds. Slightly spicy and peppery. It's going to give a really nice flavour to the coconut milk. In. Next, some cardamom seeds. Three or four onto the board. Knife on. In. A little touch of turmeric into the centre of the pan. That's going to give it a really nice spicy flavour. A little pinch of cinnamon. All the time you're doing this, those meatballs are just getting tastier and tastier. A couple of dried chilies, let them infuse in that oil. And then some lemongrass. Just take the back of your knife and sort of beat it down. That starts to release all that lovely sort of fragrance. It's like someone's just let off the most amazing fragrant air freshener in with the lemongrass. And finally, some fresh ginger. Just peel and slice nice and thinly. Time now to turn them over and let the other half for a wonderful flavour. 
chicken stock. In. Bring the stock up to the boil. Turn the gas up and then add the coconut milk. And I want the coconut milk just sitting underneath the top of the meatball. Coconut milk in. And that sort of gives it that creamy richness, but it's not heavy. It's a fragrant, light richness. Before we start simmering, check the seasoning. Mm. That nice, soft texture of the meatball. But that fragrant, light richness of the coconut broth is going to cook those meatballs perfectly. Bring the broth up to the boil, then simmer gently for eight to ten minutes. Touch them with your finger. This should be slightly pliable, but slightly springy. Gas off. I'm going to finish it off with something light and fresh. Zest of lime. But I want the zest on top of the meatball. Sort of cut through that richness. And then finally, squeeze the fresh lime. And that just gives it that nice, zesty, amazing taste. Stir in the juice. Mmm. It's got that kick and that, that vibrant taste. Now, the exciting part. When you come to serve it, be generous with that coconut broth. Tilt the pan. Get a good couple of ladles of the broth in. Mmm. Meatballs. And that is a very delicious way of eating an old-fashioned meatball and bringing it into the 21st century. And they're just as good cooked from frozen as well. The secret to stress-free cooking is making it easy for yourself. Here are three more recipes, all based on my delicious, freezer-friendly meatballs. Just defrost them before you get started. First up, beef meatballs with arrocchetti, kale and pine nuts. Add meatballs to hot oil and brown. Meanwhile, cook arrocchetti pasta, then add chopped garlic to the meatballs and shredded kale, a delicious green veg packed with vitamins which cooks in minutes. Cabbage is a great alternative if you can't get kale. Put in some of the cooking water from the pasta to steam through. When the pasta is cooked al dente, drain and add to the meatballs. Season, then finish with sweet buttery pine nuts and grated fresh parmesan cheese. Meatballs with arrocchetti, kale and pine nuts from meatballs to meal in minutes. My next easy standby supper is beef meatball sandwich with melting mozzarella and tomato salsa. Top a lightly toasted roll with pan-fried meatballs. Then tear off chunks of creamy buffalo mozzarella, pile it on and melt it under the grill. For the tangy salsa, slice sweet red onion, then add juicy diced tomatoes and roughly chopped fresh coriander. Season and drizzle with olive oil. Spoon over. Perfect in a flash. Beef meatball sandwich with melting mozzarella and a tomato salsa, a sandwich to die for. My final super easy meatball recipe it's fiery meatball soup. Fry chopped onion and finely sliced garlic in hot olive oil. Add cumin seeds for warmth and add your meatballs. Cook on a high heat to get all those aromatic flavours out. Once the meatballs are browned, add hot chilli paste for a spicy kick. Tin tomatoes dried oregano and a litre of beef stock. Then simmer. Next, add sweet corn and chopped courgettes. To finish, add hot jalapeno peppers, chopped fresh coriander and crushed tortilla chips. 
a one-pot meatball wonder that really packs a punch. Fiery meatball soup. One versatile meatball recipe, four deliciously different dishes, food that's certain to make your life in the kitchen easier and stress-free. Amazing. Whether you're making great food to freeze or to take straight to the table, you need to know how to shop for the best ingredients. Next up, my shopping guide to oils. It doesn't matter if you're baking, frying or dressing salads. Using the right oil can dramatically alter the taste and texture. Here are the most common oils and what to use them for. Sunflower oil is a good value all-rounder. Nice and light for frying, baking, in dressings and spicy dishes. Groundnut or peanut oil is great for cooking on high heat as it gets really hot without burning. Sesame oil, a flavoursome, sweet and nutty oil. Perfect sprinkled over Asian dishes before serving. Rapeseed oil is a healthier choice for using in salads. I love walnut oil. Fantastically fragrant, it's brilliant for salad dressings and it gives cakes a distinctive flavour. But the oil I use most in my cooking is olive oil. To find some of the best olive oils sold in Britain, you have to go to one of the most unlikely places. An electrical shop in London's East End. Turkish-born Mehmet Morat has olive oil in his blood. My family's produced this olive oil for centuries. What he doesn't know about it isn't worth knowing. The very best extra virgin olive oil is first cold pressed. It's actually pressed by stone and then it's put through a centrifugal spinner which spins out all the bitter waters and then you've got just pure olive oil, cold pressed olive oil and you've got to taste it to believe it. Pour a little sample, slurp it, draw it in with air, don't swallow it, warm it in your mouth, coat the whole of the inside of your mouth with it and then swallow. It will go down like fruit juice and it will leave no greasiness or oiliness in your mouth whatsoever. Absolutely sensational. Beautiful. My favourite use of any olive oils is to pour it into a, a bowl, room temperature, rub some wild oregano into it and get some fresh crusty bread and just dip it. It's food on its own. Don't need anything else. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Next, on my guide to making it easy, I'll be creating a sweet treat to drool over. I want the chocolate, like little matchsticks, dotted around. But first, my quick guide to the basic kit you need to get cooking fantastic food. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. Here are three more kitchen essentials. Whisk, spoon and spatula. These three items are so cheap, yet they are so important to great home cooking. A whisk. There's so much more control when you've got something whisking in your hand. You can gauge it so much better than you can if it's on an electric mixer. The bigger the balloon on your hand whisk, the faster it will whip as it draws in more air. Wooden spoons don't scratch pans and should be washed by hand. Spatulas are indispensable for baking or mixing. Make sure it's heat resistant so it doesn't melt. But more importantly, phenomenal for making omelettes, great with scrambled eggs, and you waste nothing because the spatula almost cleans the bowl instantly. With these three, you'll be well on your way to cooking like a pro. And you'll need all three for my next recipe. My take on classic chocolate brownies is guaranteed to put a smile on anyone's face, and not just when they're fresh out of the oven. Blondies. Stock up on these delicious blondies. They'll keep for up to a week, and it's a great way of getting ahead if you're expecting guests round. First off, melt the butter for the mixture. We've had hundreds and hundreds of brownies. The sort of white chocolate version, i.e. blondies, are amazing. A little bit more subtle. Keep a little knob of butter for the end, just to grease your baking tray. Turn the gas down and gently melt that butter. Cast the sugar into the bowl. Just give that butter a little whisk. It sort of makes the mixture a little bit lighter, slightly fluffy. Off 
with the gas. A pinch of salt in the sugar, then make a little well in the middle and sort of whisk. You can see it's already gone nice and blonde. Love it. Give that a really good mix. And the secret with the butter being slightly warm, sort of, it melts the sugar and nice and smooth. Lovely. A teaspoon of vanilla extract in. Next, lightly whisk in two whole eggs. Just give them a little beat. This is such a delicious recipe, yet yeah, so simple. Whisk in the eggs, looking for that nice, sort of rich texture, smooth paste. You can see why we call these blondes. Beautiful. Next, a teaspoon of baking powder. Baking powder in. Then half a teaspoon of baking soda. That aerates the mixture and gives it that little tartness. You'll see this sort of rise instantly the minute they hit the oven. And then your flour. Whisk with one hand and just slowly add half the flour first. Get that all mixed up. Make sure that mixture is really nice and smooth. Check it occasionally. No lumps. Half the flour in, and then the other half in. You'll feel it sort of almost go nice and firm. And that's why it's so important to add the flour in stages. It stops the mixture going lumpy. It should be just dropping off the whisk. Beautiful. Change over from a whisk to a spoon. Next, I want some texture, some nice sweet chewiness to the blondes. Dried cranberries. They bake beautifully, but it gives the blondie a really nice sort of chewy sweetness in the center. Next, my white chocolate. I'm not going to grate it. I'm going to chop it up. Just slice it like little bits of shrapnel. I want the chocolate like little matchsticks dotted around. Now, chocolate in. Lovely. Fold that in. I want a nice, even distribution of those wonderful dried cranberries. Don't over mix it. I don't want to break up that chocolate. A nice, even mix of cranberries and chocolate. You can see the chocolate. There'll be parts of the chocolate in the oven that will actually melt. It'll be like little pools of white melted chocolate in the centre. Now, baking tray. Small little knob of butter. I'm going to grease the baking tray and line it some greaseproof paper and just overextend it. Shiny side out, dull side hits the bottom of the tray. In. Greaseproof allows me to maximise on the white chocolate inside the mix. No greaseproof paper, the chocolate can melt and almost stick to the tray, so the paper is just a really nice insurance policy. Secondly, we want that rise and that sort of crispness. Now, with the mix, get your spatula Go all the way round. I don't want to see anything left in that bowl. Position the bowl over your tray. Nice and carefully. Lovely. Don't leave that slice in the bowl. Nobody's licking that one. And then just take the back of the spatula, go into the corners, push, and come back into the middle. Turn the tray around. Let it work to your advantage. Try and get it evenly positioned in the tray. If it goes in even, it cooks evenly. Make sure you smooth out the top of the blondie with the back of the spatula. And then into the oven. It's going to rise, it's going to get nice and crisp. I want that soft gooiness in the centre. Bake your blondies at 180 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes. That smells incredible. Look at that crisp edge on the outside and that sort of soft, gooey centre. Leave that to cool down and it's going to sort of firm up and wrinkle, but it'll stay nice and gooey in the centre. Once it's cooled down, take it out and start slicing. Mouth-watering blondes, a fantastic easy treat to have on hand for yourself or to share. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. 
To make your life easier, make sure you make the most of your freezer. My tip for amazing tuna carpaccio is to freeze it first, and it will slice beautifully. It's wise to save leftover wine for cooking. My tip is to freeze the remaining wine in freezer bags or ice cube trays. It's great in stocks and sauces. When you freeze soups or stews in tubs, the tip is not to overfill them. Leave room to expand in the container. A great tip for a cheap homemade ice cream, buy a high quality vanilla ice cream and make it your own by mixing in berries, chocolate, or my favorite, rum and boozy raisins. A fantastic tip for leftover lemons and limes is to cut them into wedges, freeze and use them like ice cubes. They won't water down your drink and they'll also add flavor. Okay, now it's all about special salads and fabulous fruits. Perfect for special occasions. Cooking at home for special occasions falls into two camps. Sit-down affairs where the food's a bit more formal and relax parties where dishes are laid out and people can choose what they want to eat and when. If you're cooking for a party, always make dishes that are colourful, vibrant and exciting to eat. So you'll grab your guests' attention and really wow their taste buds. My first dish has plenty of attitude. Enough for any special occasion. A flavour-packed green papaya salad. This is a great salad to serve at a party. It's delicious and robust enough to last the whole evening without wilting. First off, these are a little dried shrimp. You can buy them anywhere. They smell almost sort of of the seabed into the pestle mortar. For this salad, inspired by my travels across Thailand, I'm starting by making a wonderfully spicy paste. A little salt in there. In, just break them up. This paste is like a staple ingredient in Thailand. That's what we're looking for, almost. It's like a powder. Right, next, just one clove of garlic. Slice up the garlic and get that into the pestle mortar. Bird's eye chili, incredibly hot, powerful, but wow, it does give an amazing kick to the paste. In to the mix. Now, a couple of tablespoons of brown caster sugar. That softens the blow with the chili. And then, just to get that nice sour taste, a little bit of hot water into this tamarind paste. It's a really tart but sweet paste. One tablespoon in. Fish sauce. Now, it's got that almost sort of pickly smell, slightly salty, but the flavor is intense. Two tablespoons in. Bring that together and give it a really good mix. Some lime juice in half. Another touch of sort of tartness. The paste is nice and thick and fragrant, but it's got the heat, the sourness, the tartness. Incredible. Green papaya. Stand it up and give it a little peel. You can find green papaya in local Asian shops and bigger supermarkets. And as it doesn't wilt like more delicate veg, it's perfect for robust salads like this. I'm going to grate it. And look, that's what I want. These thin slithers. Next, a nice, rich, sweet banana shallot. Nice. Some carrot. Carrot gives it another texture. Now, lift all that and mix it. Finish that off with Thai basil and fresh coriander. Thai basil is a much more fragrant Basil, it's stronger and it's slightly thicker as well. Like papaya and tamarind paste, you can get Thai basil in good supermarkets and independent Asian stores, but normal basil works well too. Next, prepare the crunchy topping. Pan on and toast some peanuts. Chop the nuts, that gives a really nice crunch. In they go. Roll them around the pan. Gas off. Just tip them out. Now for the exciting part. We're going to dress the salad. A nice spoon of dressing in to the papaya. Mix that in. And then 
finally, a nice general sprinkling of roasted nuts. And that is one delicious, very fragrant, very robust green papaya salad. So easy to make and guaranteed not to go limp. A perfect party salad. And with such incredible colours, textures and bold, exciting flavours, it's sure to grab your guests' attention. When you're putting together a feast for the family or friends, it's great to have some bulletproof salads in your cooking repertoire. Here are three more of my favourites to set you up. First, my delicious chopped salad. Slice cherry tomatoes in half and add to the bowl. Along with chopped red pepper and finely diced shallots. Next, slice salami into strips and add. Follow with nutty chickpeas and smooth Edam cheese. Cut into matchsticks, building up different tastes, textures and flavours as you go. Next, add chicory for a deliciously bitter bite. Then chop crisp romaine lettuce and add. For the dressing, finely chopped garlic, add cherry vinegar, a shake of spicy Worcestershire sauce, cast the sugar and olive oil, then simply whisk. Pour the dressing over the salad and mix so that everything is thoroughly coated. Finally, sprinkle with dried oregano for an aromatic finish. A salad so easy, if you can chop, you can make it. With such delicious results, it has to be tasted to be believed. My next simple salad that's perfect for a party is green bean salad with mustard dressing. For the dressing, wrap a whole bulb of garlic in foil and roast it in a hot oven. Next, add top and tail green beans to salted boiling water and cook for just a couple of minutes. This is called blanching and keeps the beans deliciously crunchy. Strain the beans and refresh in cold water. This stops the cooking process so they stay crisp and green. Next, remove your garlic from the oven. Cut off the head and squeeze out all the glorious garlic, which has gone creamy, mellow and divine in the oven. Then simply add sharp white wine vinegar, a dollop of Dijon mustard and sweet runny honey. Season and pour in a good glug of olive oil. Then whisk. Add the crunchy blanche green beans and top with toasted almonds for a lovely nutty note and crunchy texture. Mix well and serve. Heavenly mustard vinaigrette with a hit of mellow roast garlic. Stunning green beans dressed to perfection. My next salad that's great for any big bash is roasted red pepper, lentil and herb salad. Add pre lentils to vegetable stock, along with a bay leaf and boil for 15 minutes. Pre lentils are perfect for salads. They have a great meaty flavour and a delicious bite for texture. Next, chop sweet red peppers and place on a baking tray, along with diced courgette. Drizzle over olive oil, season and roast in a hot oven. To assemble the salad, Place the drained lentils in a large bowl. Then add olive oil. And chop some blushed tomatoes. Take the roasted red peppers and courgettes from the oven and add. Along with chopped avocado, as its delicious creamy flesh gives the salad a lovely contrast. Season. Then for a big herby hit, chop a handful of chives and basil and add. Squeeze over lemon juice and mix. Earthy, aromatic and packed full of goodness. Absolutely stunning, served with roasted meats and fish or perfect eaten just by itself. Three incredible salads, all bursting with flavour, colour and health. 
so quick and easy to prep and utterly delicious. You'll be making them every day, not just on a special occasion. Nice. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Coming up, I'll be using fabulous fruit to create a show-stopping dessert. Every time I get to put one of these together, it's like a sort of little jewellery box. But first, the key to dishes that really impress is amazingly fresh ingredients, and it's essential to get the best for your money when you're out shopping. So, make sure whatever you're buying, it looks, smells, and feels really good. And if you get the chance, then taste it before you buy it. Great tasting salad starts with fantastic salad leaves. And when it comes to all things green, there's little Dr. Steve Rothwell doesn't know. I think I am obsessed with salad. I'm obsessed primarily with watercress. That, 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 that's in my heart, cos, you know, I've got a PhD in watercress. A doctorate in salad? We should all take a leaf out of his book, then. He's not only been studying salad leaves for over 30 years, he's been growing them, so he really knows his rocket from his romaine. There are literally thousands of varieties of salad. Things like Batavian lettuce, red vein spinach, wild rocket, sorrel. We grow virtually everything outdoors and, and we follow the seasons. So we're not forcing the leaves. We don't give them too much fertilizer or irrigation. We, we try to grow them a little bit slower. And that's a way to get the best flavor and the best quality of leaf. We'll harvest a crop, cut it in the morning, and it's then on the road going out to customers to be on the shelf the next day. This is a great leaf, baby leaf spinach. And we call it baby leaf, you know, quite literally, because we cut it when it's still at a baby stage. These are baby pea shoots. We'll put something like three or 400 pea seeds into the seed bed, and then in as little as 12, 14 days, they've grown to a sort of a crop like this. They've got the flavor of fresh peas, a bit of sweetness, and, they, and they've got a really nice soft velvety leaf texture. This is baby watercress, which is my favourite salad crop of them all. Watercress is special because, by definition, it's grown in pure flowing water. Fresh watercress has got that fantastic, pungent, peppery flavour. In Victorian London, it was known as poor man's bread, whereby a lot of workers would start the day with a watercress sandwich, and if they couldn't afford bread, they just ate the watercress straight. It is amazing, full of flavour. I can't eat enough. Salad Obsessed Steve's spot on. There's hundreds of salad leaves available with different textures, tastes and colours. Here are five of my favourite everyday salad leaves and don't forget, some of them are delicious cooked too. Little gem, sweet and crisp and an amazingly dense heart. These mini cos lettuces are great simply braised in the oven or use the leaves as scoops for a delicious chilli beef filling. Mustard leaves, pungent, spicy, and full of vitamin C. These are a staple in Asian dishes and are fantastic stir-fried or steamed. Lamb's leaf, full of tangy flavor and with incredible springy stems. Great for hearty, robust salads or simply paired with fish for a healthier, simple supper. Rocket, these distinctive peppery leaves are actually classed as a herb and are perfect in soups or with fruits and are full of iron. Finally, chicory or endive. These tightly packed red or white leaves have a deliciously bitter taste and are great wrapped in ham or alongside sharp blue cheeses. I think when you're shopping for salads, you can just shop with your eyes. You know, if it looks fresh and, and healthy, tasty, it is. You want to look for bright colours. I like to see leaves with a bit of moisture on them. Salads like to be kept cold and moist, basically, so when you buy a pack of salad, put it in the fridge, and if you don't use it all in one go, roll up the bag to exclude surplus air, put it back in the fridge, keep it cold. There's so much choice variety out there. I really do think people should be more adventurous in their choice of salads, you know, both what they choose to try and eat and, and what they do with them. So get yourself some ingredients, use them boldly, and your salad leaves can really take centre stage. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. Scallops are a fantastic ingredient when you want a special salad that really impresses. Here's how to prepare them. Do not be intimidated trying to get the scallop out. I'm going to show you how easy it is to take them out and how much more exciting it is to get them fresh in the shell. So just basically a dessert spoon and a blunt knife. Put the knife in to the bottom and you just twist open. Tilt the knife up so it doesn't cut into the scallop meat. Run the knife from the top to the base. 
off with the lid. No flesh on there. And then from there, that's called the scallop skirt. All you do is just peel that forward and get the spoon to run down the back of the shell. And the idea is to remove that little bit of muscle that holds the scallop onto the bottom shell. Bang, it pops out. That's the top, the small side of the bottom. There's the muscle there, and your thumb just slides neatly in there and run your fingers round. And you just pop out the scallop and look. Bang. Beautiful. This bit here is called the skirt. No use. Doesn't taste anything. Now, that's the coral. You can slice that off, dry it in the oven, and use it as a powder for your risottos or even seasoning fish with. But that's the money. These just need to be rinsed under cold water, dried, and ready for the pan. Tomatoes are another salad staple. Here's how to skin them for extra refinement. Score each one with a cross at the bottom. Blanch in boiling water for a minute, then shot them in cold water, and the skins will easily peel away. Pomegranates are a fabulous fruit for adding glamour to salads or desserts. The trick to getting the seeds out, slice in half lengthways, make slits around the edge, turn upside down over a bowl, and using a large spoon, whack as hard as you can to release the seeds. To take fabulous fruit puts to the next level, my tip is to add sophisticated quenelles of ice cream or lemon mascarpone. Simply dip two metal spoons in hot water, scoop, shape, and add. And after baking, never throw out your leftover pastry. It's easily transformed into grapefruit or savoury party nibbles. Roll out. Grate parmesan or sprinkle over your favourite fruit. Roll and then just slice and bake. As any chef knows, at the end of a meal, you want to leave your guests on a high with a spectacular dessert. So, when you're cooking for a special occasion and want to make an impact, it's great to have a fabulous fruit dessert up your sleeve. My last recipe looks sensational and tastes just as good. Raspberry milfoy. Desserts should always have that wow factor. And this dish is incredibly simple to prepare, but it tastes and looks absolutely stunning. First off, puff pastry. You can buy fabulous puff pastry. Now, a non-stick baking tray and just lay the puff pastry on the tray. I want to get the top of the puff pastry caramelised, so we're going to dust it in icing sugar. Now, milfoy means a thousand layers. Just lightly dust the top of the puff pastry with icing sugar. We're going to start off in a hot oven at 220 for the first six or seven minutes, and then 10 minutes at 190 into the oven. Now for the filling. Fresh vanilla. Cream in and start whisking. Want the cream whisked nice and thick. But look, got all that nice fresh vanilla seeds in there. Next, a nice scraping of orange zest, orange liqueur. Don't whisk that in, fold it in, and that stops the cream from separating. Lovely. Now, take that out of the bowl and put it into a piping bag. Unwrap over your hand in a way that you're creating this little pocket. Snip off the end, nozzle in, load up your bag. Just twist slowly. There's no air. The bag is nice and full. I'm firm. Nice. Chill your gorgeous vanilla and orange cream in the fridge until you're ready to pipe it. Wow. That is beautiful. There's the layers there. That's the, the milfoy pub. Gently lift it up onto the board. I'm going to slice it into three. Serrated edge knife. Oh. 
Beautiful. Start deciding on how you're going to layer it. That bit there. That's nice and firm for my base. That's nice and decorative for the top. And that bit there for the middle. Take out your cream. And put a little touch of cream there. And that just sticks that down. Stops it from sliding. Pipe very carefully. A nice thin layer of cream round the outside and come back into the middle. Beautiful. Now, the raspberries. Sit them two by two. Now, this layer, you'll turn it upside down and put the caramelised part of the pastry on top of the raspberries. Every time I get to put one of these together, it's like a sort of little jewellery box. Again, cream. Squeeze from the back of the bag so you've got control. The raspberries, two by two. I just want to put another layer of cream on top of those raspberries because I want some height with my final layer. Whoa, I just want to dive in there. Put the lid on it. Mmm. And push that down. There you have a beautiful, stunning, simple millefeuille, a dessert to die for. And like all the dishes in my ultimate cookery course, I guarantee it will taste as sensational as it looks. I've now shown you 100 recipes to stake your life on. Smells amazing. Simple and accessible dishes. Look at that. To give you confidence in the kitchen. Hold the drum and slice straight through. And help cook yourself into a better chef. Really important to season the mince before you cook it. I've shared essential tips and insider knowledge. They don't actually smell much, but the flavour they give off is extraordinary. On everything from shopping for great ingredients. Don't be frightened. Get your nose right into it. To my kitchen equipment essentials. The secret of braising is having a really nice, thick, durable pan. And my ultimate cooking lessons, key mantras to make you fearless in the kitchen. Stripping away all the complexity so you can whip up tasty and delicious dishes with ease. Just finish it with a little tablespoon of that sauce. And most importantly, learn to enjoy cooking at home. Incredible. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. So what are you waiting for? Go on, get cooking.